This session is dedicated to the classification of the LA and uh, this is a very important aspect because on the base of the classification we decide uh, and we design the procedure. Uh, I want to start from what uh, we have today. Uh, the most widely used classification is the one classification. It's based on the CT scan of uh, 612 patients and on the, base, on the base of the uh, anatomical, uh, I would say, geometrical description of the LA, divides the LA morphology in four categories. The cactus, cauliflower, chicken wing, and windsock. This classification is uh, uh, mainly uh, qualitative, and a uh, few years after, uh, they introduced uh, some uh, quantitative uh, aspects for a, a more precise characterization of the, and the more reproducible uh, classification of the ODLA. Uh, the introduction of the definition of the ostium, that is the red dashed line, uh, the definition of uh, what is the length of the LA, that is the, the line, the center line that connect the ostium with the farthest uh, point of the main lobe of the LA, and the concept of the of the bending. The the grade of the of the bending is the angle between an imaginary vertical line. You see the the uh, um, dashed line in the chicken wing imaging, uh, between this line and the, the main axe of the uh, LA in the main lobe from that point to the farthest um, point of the uh, LA. On the base of this additional uh, quantitative uh, uh, data, we can review the classification and uh, the cactus is defined uh, as uh, one dominant central lobe, one or more secondary lobes, and total length less than four centimeters. Uh, the presence of a secondary lobes extend fr from the central lobe in the both superior and inferior direction is sometimes noted. And variations of this type relate to the number, location, and orientation of the secondary lobes. Chicken wing. The chicken wing is defined as one lobe, total length more than four centimeter, bed, bend angle less than 100 degree in the proximal or middle parts of the dominant lobe or folding back of the LA anatomy and itself and at some distance from the perceived LA ostium, with or without secondary lobes or twings. Windsock. Windsock, the definition is one dominant lobe, total length more than four centimeters, and the bend angle over 100 degree. Variation of this LA type arises with the location of numbers of secondary, even tertiary lobes, raising from the dominant lobe in the inferior direction. And finally, uh, the cauliflower. Cauliflower, a total length less than four centimeters and a complex internal structure and there is a list of variability of this LA on the base of the regularity, the presence of, uh, of uh, additional lobe, and so on. Uh, the same classification provides also the description of the, of the morphology of the shape of the orifice that is uh, divided in five types, oval, triangular, foot-like, 
water drop like and round. Of course, uh, this um, classification is arbitrary because the variability is, of course, is a, a continuum of a continuum spectrum where sometimes it's difficult to define if uh, is over is a triangular and for like, for example. But it's a base. The main problem of uh, this classification that is highlighted in this uh, um, in this study. Uh, that includes eight studies uh, with 2,596 patients, uh, is that the variability of the chicken wing, for example, ranges from 13% to 52%, cauliflower from 3% to 40%, and cactus from 5 to 38 and finally, windsock from 10 to 37 that's mean that the variability in the classification is extremely uh, wide and the reproducibility of the classification or the use of this classification is extremely low. More recently, uh, these colleagues proposed the simplified classification. It's based not on the CT scan but on uh, uh, 200 uh, autoptic human heart uh, without the story of atrial fibrillation and they introduce some more uh, qualitative aspects and the, the, the classification uh, includes the LA in three categories, the cauliflower, chicken wing, and harrow tree. Uh, the main limitation is that this classification uh, was not conceived uh, for the implanters, but to uh, to, to look for a, a link between the morphology and the risk of ischemic stroke. It's very interesting that the distribution of the additional lobes, one or more than one, uh, but this, this uh, distribution is of course influenced by the definition of this category. So my first question to the audience is who, how many in the room when plan a procedure has in mind this one of these two classification. Raise your hand. I, uh, the question is, I am using, uh, when I plan the procedure, okay, I think, okay, I, I'm, I, I, I am uh, planning a cauliflower uh, LA, or uh, no, I, I, I don't see this kind of classification because it's not helpful for the procedure. Who thinks that is helpful? Right, so yeah, and uh, they uh, use it for the for the planning. And the second question is: uh, Do you think that the information contained in this classification is helpful to predict the procedural success and the risk of a complication? If yes, raise your hand. Okay, we are using a classification, but we think that is not helpful. For the, for, the, for the planning of the procedure. While I was preparing this presentation, I reflected on the fact, what, what, what do, do I do when I plan a case? Uh, my attention is concentrating on the proximal portion of the LA. I try to understand uh, if I dip for advance the uh, getting catheter or, and, and consequently then the device. Uh, I check to understand, I try to understand the orientation of the uh, LA, the main axis of the LA, and to understand uh, the, if it's possible to, uh, to understand if it's possible to get a good alignment of the guiding catheter with the main axis of the LA. One of the main problem is that if I, I select correctly the device, but I'm not able to get a perfect alignment with the main axe, probably the uh, deployment of the device uh, will, will not be successful. Then I take into account if uh, the, there is a ridge, the width of the ridge, and then I check and I measure the geometrical characteristic of the ostium. Maximum diameter, minimum diameter, the shape, and the and Usually, I calculate the, the um, diameter uh, from the perimeter from the area. 
and exactly the same is what they do for the landing zone. Of course, the landing zone is not an anatomical structure, so it depends on the device that I intend to use. For example, if I want to use an amulet, the landing zone is more or less 10 millimeters uh, distal to the ostium and so on for other devices. So a long list of information that I need are not contained in the classification that uh, we currently uh, use. An additional problem, as I mentioned before, is the how to get the best alignment of the guiding catheter with the main axe of the LA. Basically, it's a 3D angle, uh, so we have to take into account, to account uh, how is anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, and probably we have to use the um, spheric angle to understand the real uh, orientation in the space of the main axis of the LA. Uh, and in my mind, I imagine to be in front of the guiding catheter, and uh, I am inside the LA, I see the catheter, I think, okay, uh, this, the main axis of the LA is uh, in line with the guiding catheter, so this is a good position. Or the orientation of the LA is anterior superior, or superior posterior, or posterior inferior, or inferior anterior, and with different degree of orientation, different angles. And each one of this position and each one of this angulation correspond to a different complexity and different probability of success of the procedure. If I have an, uh, the main axis of the LED is perfectly oriented in line with my guiding catheter, the probability is high. Probably is not the same, I have not the same probability of success if it's oriented posterior or inferior. So uh, my consideration is that the current classification uh, system may not be replicable and exact, is based on pure anatomical geometric description. Uh, the classification uh, available do not focus on the proximal portion needed for the interventionist, and that is exactly where we replaced our device. The shape and the orifice of the LA was not influenced by the LA body shape. So when I say is uh, which chicken wing, this is not information on the, on the ostium. The um, current classification are mainly aimed to predict the correlation between the shape of the LA and the risk of uh, uh, cardioembolic events. And uh, if you look, are looking uh, to a new classification for intervention, it should take into consideration a long list of technical aspects that we will address during the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Can we have slides? So, uh, as Sergio said, the current classification is not really useful, uh, even to plan the procedure or to anticipate complication rates or complexity of the procedure. So, we would like to discuss with you and propose some relevant classification parameters of course, we will need interaction at the end or during the presentation, if you want. Um, first of all, we think that the classification should be comprehensive, intuitive, and user-friendly, not something too complex to use. One of the most point is that we should talk, speak the same language, implanters and imagers, which is not the same with the, the current classification. So we will try to find parameters that are relevant, in terms of relevant meaning that are associated with adverse complexity or adverse clinical outcomes or really something clinically relevant. And we want the classification to discriminate complex but also standard cases, not all are complex of course, and to anticipate the potential risk of complications. This is the appendage that you know. They are the region of the appendage. They are probably 
part of the classification. Of course, we know what is the ostium. Landing zone, as Sergio said, is something that is not anatomical, but something that is also device specific, but also the distal part of the LAA uh, that can be involved in terms of shape, but also angulation and function. So we decided to present five components uh, for our uh, ELAC parameters. The first one is the entrance of the LAA that you all know with the name of ostium. The second one is the landing zone or neck of the appendage. Then we'll have the anatomical regions of the left atrial appendage or the distal appendage the appearance or shape of the appendage, because it's important to know which one is a chicken wing or not. And finally, the clinical of the LAA, meaning the functional of the LAA. So these are the components. Uh, Jens Erik, if you want to present. Yeah, let's, let's take a, a closer look on each of those categories. Uh, let's start with the ostium. Uh, if we are using a lobe and disc type device, it is essential that we can cover the full orifice with the disc and having a very large ostium can be an issue. I mean, the largest disc of an amulet device is 41. If we are near to that value, it's going to be a challenge for us. So a very large ostium can be a challenge. Another thing that we have realized is uh, to have a long PV ridge uh, where we have a disc that ends up uh, uh, quite far from the uh, pulmonary vein ridge uh, can result in some hemodynamic disturbances and there's an increased risk of DIT. Also, in some appendages, uh, if we look relative to our transeptal puncture site in the oval fossa, it's, they can be with a very low position, very near to the uh, AV valve area, and that can uh, introduce some uh, challenges for us. And very rarely we see interaction with the mitral valve, but we can have that with a large disc, and especially also if we have a bioprosthetic ring uh, uh, inside the heart that can be an issue. So please take a look at this and think about if you have other anatomical factors related to the ostium that you believe is a challenge or a difficulty in your procedures. Have we thought about everything related to the ostium or do you have uh, other things you would also uh, take in this category? Totally correct, and uh, that would also apply to some of the other risk factors we uh, are going to present. Uh, I totally agree. This is mainly related to lobe disc devices, uh, those factors here. Uh, Jens Erik, if you go yeah. back to the slides. I mean, for me, if I think of an ostium, typically ostium is not complex, but it's, um, it's more an appendage where the ostium is not defined. I mean, you have these appendages which keep on going open to the yeah. common ridge, and you don't know actually where that ostium stops or starts. Yeah. And that's and for me the challenging ones, and that's more at risk for embolization or to implant. That's, that's the tricky ones for me. That's exactly what yeah. I wanted to, to say. And I would say that in the contrary, sometimes you have a closed ostium, uh, which could allow to, to add this to the classification because then you have two or three different uh, components of this item, yeah. you, you see. One very open that you cannot defin define, one which is closed and it's strange and you, you will have to take it in, in, in account, and the very regular one. Maybe. I agree that are anatomies where you have some kind of infundibulum before the real ostium. Uh, in some way, there's an overlap with the anatomies with a long PV ridge. It's a little bit overlapping, but you can also see for the next region here, we have this defined a, f a funnel shape as one of the risk factors. But you could consider to yeah, add maybe infundibulum 
or something like that. That's what you really mean. That yes. there's a Maybe we have to define exactly what uh, do we mean uh, with ostium. No. no, but I I I get the then then we should add another anatomical <laughs> region. And then I, we I would. I would consider um, a lobe which is originating right at the ostium, and I have a couple of cases like that, which can be really difficult. So um, a, a lobe, a side lobe uh, originating, so to say, from the ostium level um, would be a very a factor that complicates the procedure for me. Yeah. And, and also the, the eccentricity. I mean, sometimes you have like two, ver two proximal lobes. And, and then you have like this eccentric because it's just the sum of these two lobes. So eccentricity, extreme eccentricity, um, I think that would be also something important because at the end, you know, like what you want in those cases because you don't want just to leave the lobes open, so you want to close the ostium. So you're using a special devices for those. Yeah, point taken. Uh, anyone that wanna make some notes so we can? I, I, I think just, just to say that uh, some of the, the parameters are, I mean, we need to define it in a, in a better way, for example. Uh, you see some cutoff, but sometimes it's like semi-quantitative. For example, what is a long PV reach, for example? From where do you measure? If you want to standardize what is a long PV reach in, in the registry or things like that, I mean, you, we need to, to have some clear definition of, of, of what should be the anatomical ostium of the appendage and things like that. So. Uh, we, we need to, yeah, to, to define some anatomical landmarks that we can use to define some of those criteria. Yeah, um, I, I agree with Abel. How did, how did you end up with this uh, 15 millimeter cutoff to define the long reach? Because as Ole said, uh, we cannot, uh, I mean, move on with this idea to measure with the very old 45 degree view the, the reach, the, the reach, because basically we don't know where is the anatomical uh, Austrian mm. from that perspective and in, in 3D CT is slightly more easy but uh, I, I, I wanted to ask you how did you get this 15 millimeter? Yeah, no, the, the numbers that you see on this slide is not uh, meant as very specific, a very specific definition because what you are saying is that in many cases you will not be able to give a precise measurement and it will be very, very difficult to define in every case. So this is sort of as a more practical concept that you as an implanter consider this to be a very large ostium or you think you have struggled in this case or when you see it on CT with a long PV ridge. Uh, we have discussed uh, whether we could be more precise and give very, very uh, um, sharp definitions of things, I think that would be uh, very, very difficult. But let's, we can come back to the discussion and you can see what we else have to present here, I think. So next anatomical region uh, will be uh, what we call the landing zone. And again, this, as already said by Sergio, this is uh, device specific. But again, here, if you have a very large uh, landing zone, you can get uh, difficulties from uh, some of the devices that they cannot actually cover the full uh, landing zone diameter. And in the same way, if you have very small appendages, we might have uh, devices that can really create some damage. So uh, a very large and a very small a landing zone area uh, can be a problem. If we have a very high ovality in the landing zone area, that is something that we know, not from many, but from a few studies, can lead to leaks, uh, and uh, it can be difficult to get a full sealing in those landing zone areas. It's a complex factor. Again, 1.5 is just meant as a rough guidance, and uh, the same is true for the numbers uh, above for large and small appendages. It's not meant as very specific numbers. To have a proximal bifurcation uh, at the landing zone will, of course, create a challenge. Uh, can we land a lobe there, and can we land a monocomponent device? Uh, how do we cover both lobes? If we have uh, 
a very proximal lobe, we can end up uh, having an uncovered proximal lobe. If we in the landing zone have large pectinates that can obstruct with the expansion of the lobe or the, the device. And the one we are alluding to before, if we have a very uh, conical funnel shaped landing zone where you cannot see precisely where should we measure, where should I put my disc. If you have very limited implantation depth, that is uh, of course a challenge for some of the devices uh, that has a certain length. Again, it will be device specific with AMOLED requiring 10 to 12 millimeter and Watchman Flex maybe a little bit more. And also if we have a very pronounced uh, axis relative to uh, our transeptal puncture site, uh, I think we see most often problems with, if we have a very pronounced anterior axis because it can be very uh, demanding to get a very good coaxiality and we may end up with a tilted device uh, in some of those cases. Um, also, if the landing zone is in close relationship to the pulmonary artery, that is uh, a challenging factor. So that is some of the parameters that we encounter regarding the landing zone and uh, consider to be uh, challenging factors. And Zirik, maybe back to that yes. slide also. I mean, I think short neck or, s or small or short implantation net is two different things. I mean, um, a short neck, then I think you, what you mean is probably a, a real chicken wing. So you almost don't have a kind of landing zone. So you have something that goes into the appendage and immediately you have a sharp turn. That stays difficult with any device. It's typically easy to put the device in, but you will have leaks or with the watchman you have to decide either you go deep in or you go too proximal yeah. and you have a lot of shoulder or with the amulet you end up in a kind of a sandwich implantation. So you can do it, but it's, it's just harder. That's about if you have a short neck or a very, so to me, the angulation of the LAA, that's, yeah. that should be definitely a parameter. And then whether you have lots or, uh, it doesn't mean having a shaker wing, you can have plenty of implantation depth. It doesn't mean it's very shallow. Um, so that's something else. Whereas if having a very amputated short appendage, that's of course very difficult, but that can even be difficult if it's not angulated. So I think it's two different things. I totally agree. And, uh I think we compensate a little bit for this comment uh, with the last category of the anatomy here, looking at the distal LAA, because uh, here you have built in also the orientation uh, as a problem. The distal part of the LAA, if that is orientated like a reverse chicken wing. So uh, you could characterize, a, you have a real problem if you have the combination of a short neck and a reverse chicken wing. But I agree, we might, we might specify it out. Uh, we could specify it out in, yeah, maybe both short neck and small implantation depths. Because it, 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 also, if you can come back, I am not, I, I'm not pretty sure if it's necessary to these first two points, large and small, to specify the to, to certain devices, no. because as you can see, the differences are small, and yeah. probably each of us close even uh, smaller appendages yeah. also with Watchman Flex, so I am not sure that we should be device specific like here. And uh, what Ole has mentioned, short neck and small implantation I, uh, depth, I will uh, split it to two different points. Uh, then it's more yeah. clear for me. Yeah, that's a good comment. In terms, Eric, so at, at the end, because um, so you said that we have to be in, in a sense simple but also comprehensive, the thing is all these factors are just to tell if the ostium it's easy or not, if the landing zone it's easy or not. I mean, if, if the landing zone, for example, has nothing of this, it means that then it will be simple. No, so that's the the goal, no, of this of this classification. Because like here, it looks like very, very, very difficult because there are a lot of factors. But at the end, so what we're looking for, it's that if it's going to be yes or no. Is, is, is that correct or? Yeah, these parameters uh, I will show you, they should tell us about the complexity exactly. of the procedure. That's one thing. And they should also uh, try to 
in some way uh, predict some of the risks that can be associated. <coughs> But we can come back to that because that's yeah, part that's, of the classification uh, as well. One yeah. quick comment. Yeah. When we talk about sore neck, as, as Marek has just said, we can say sore neck, what, this, what makes the difference is you can do sandwich technique or not. So we can say just sore, sore neck plus sandwich technique uh, possibility or not. So that, that will make this easier to define what we want to do. Mm, yeah, I get your point, but I also agree with Marek's comment that we have to be uh, a little bit uh, skeptical about uh, mentioning specific devices because it will change all the time and we'll get new devices. And I'm also uh, really uh, mostly pro just talking about a large landing zone on a small and then the implanter can think relative yeah. to the device I have in my hand or I have planned to use. I, I don't think we need to be that specific. Then it will be very uh, yeah. impractical. Maybe not just saying sandwich technique. We can say sort neck that modify your current strategy, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Or the regular strategy. Is it... Um, uh, just a, a quick comment on the previous slide, and um, you say that you want, we have to analyze the relationship between uh, the landing zone and, and the pulmonary artery, uh, which is sound. I think we should also consider analyzing the relationship between the landing zone and the circumflex artery. I think the distance, just be, if the distance is too short, there's, there might be a risk of uh, compression. Um, yeah, At least in my experience. I get your point, but I mean personally, I have never, never, never experienced a compression of the circumflex artery, even with a stent inside the circumflex artery. And I think it's very difficult to predict whether you should stay away with your device or not. Uh, I don't think we have that information. And we have tried systematically to measure on this as well, and I can s tell you that we have a lot of cases where we are extremely close with, for instance, the lobe of, of an amulet device to the circumflex and there's no clinical consequences. So I think it's in extremely rare uh, situations. To me, it's, it's very uh, unusual. I agree yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jens Erik, I'm, when I look at the, I'm not sure that uh, the close relationship to the pulmonary artery and, and uh, the fact that you, there's a risk of compressing the, the circ, it doesn't say anything about uh, the complexity of the implantation. I mean, uh, no. you, 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 will, you, you will try to, to, to do your best to implant the device coaxial to the neck and so on. Yeah. And it's so rare, actually, that you have a perforator. Who, who is going to look at a... Uh, uh, at the, the distance between the pulmonary artery and, and the, the appendage and so on. And, uh, and if you put that in the classification and you have, for example, that item as a single one, you will not say it's complex, actually. It, there is a risk, okay, like, uh, like uh, many other factors, but it will not influence your implantation technique. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. uh, two different aspects. One is the risk of a complication. The other is the uh, technical approach to the procedure. Yeah. And uh, probably... If uh, the, um, the classification is aimed to, to be easy to use, we have to, to simplify because uh, this list, uh, each one of these uh, um, parameters um, is not influencing in the same way the final result. The weight, I mean, the weight is different. If you have a proximal bifurcation, or uh, if we have a conical uh, funnel shape, probably the, the weight of these two uh, parameters is not exactly the same. So we have to create a list of priority. There's still a comment from the audience. I think, um, I think that uh, we need to think who is going to use it. Our, if these are experts of, of, of uh, LA occluders, that had implants hundreds, it's maybe good for them, but I'm not sure that if you want to approach to the average implanter, I'm not sure that he can understand all of this. 
I must say that I'm not really understanding most of it, not most of it, but part of it. And if we want it to be a tool and not just a paper, maybe we need to simplify it a bit better. Mm -hmm. Mm. This is uh, definitely meant to be a practical tool for the implanter. And I think most of us will look on those parameters before we go and do the case, especially those that are doing pre-procedural CT. And, and yeah, we can, we can of, course, of course discuss whether some would be less necessary and we can pick out the most important ones. But we don't want an academic classification. We really want a practical classification that can reflect the complexity when you go into the patient, but also reflect, uh, for instance, that you can implant the device and get a higher risk, for instance, of DRT if you have a very long bridge or something like that, or that you can have a risk of tamponade if you have an extreme close relationship to the PA. That's, that's our thinking about this. And maybe, therefore, uh, let, let us just present the, the two other ca categories and, and we can discuss and come back in details. One of the things we also want is still to have the same language so uh, it makes sense for us still to talk about the general shape of the, of the LAA. I mean, for me, I never use the cactus morphology, but f it makes sense to me. It's easy for me to identify when I have a sharp bend, then I have a windsock. Uh, sorry, uh, when I have a sharp bend, I have a chicken wing, a windsock, simple, long appendage, cauliflower, relatively short appendage with a, a lot of lobes. I think we can, we can probably agree about those are the three most important morphologies also in, uh, in correspondence with the latest uh, anatomical uh, suggestion for this uh, classification. Yeah. And then I can talk to my colleague and I can explain today I have a windsock with a very oval shaped or very e epileptic landing zone, and I have additional, a very large pectinate in the landing zone area, for example. It's a way, it, it, we, we will try to make a classification so we can speak about the same language without necessarily showing a picture of the uh, appendage. And then we also have the functional parameters, which we have alluded to uh, earlier today. It is a risk factor or complicating factor if you have sinus rhythm and especially if you have hypovolemia or very highly contractile LAA, that's also a complex factor. That's something uh, where we can uh, realize that sizing is difficult and may be uh, associated with a high embolization rate, et cetera. And of course, we ha can have appendages with LAA thrombus where we, despite it's a contraindication, it might be an old thrombus and we might have decided to go uh, for closure anyway. So this is also a, a one of the factors. And the idea has been also to, to try to use all those parameters to try to grade how complex is this appendage. Is it a simple appendage? Is it a moderate complex? Is it highly complex? Or is it maybe an impossible? And that can be if is one or two or more factors present. But I think we have to also uh, make a grading of each of these factors. At, and this is a proposal from Nina, where you try to prioritize some of the uh, single parameters that we have shown in order to try to categorize between simple, challenging, very challenging, impossible, etc. So, shall we? Yeah. Uh, we need time to discuss, uh, but we. We have a little bit more. We have some examples of. Uh, yeah, we can we can show a lot of examples. We have examples of CT, echo, angiograms, showing this kind of complexities. But I think the most important of this session 
is to talk about yeah, if a, a, a factor is not who should not be, uh, maybe we have to vote or decide together. And another point is about the grading. I think it's really important and the next uh, discussion we'll have uh, is about how to grade the procedure. Because as you said, some of these fact parameters are device specific and some of combinations do completely different results in terms of complexity. If you have something elliptic, but it's okay, it's not too proximal with no lobes, etc. it's like okay. But if you have to change, to challenge a complex transeptal uh, origin plus a reverse plus um, something with pectinates or something like that, this become almost impossible to close. So this combination of parameters Philippe, should be also... Question here, but may, maybe can you explain also to me and everybody else, like what's the ultimate goal of this? Is this... You want to use this as a research tool that you think like yeah, uh, everybody classifies then in a certain category and then afterwards you can grade, okay, if you have such a class, a green class, the risk of, of leaks is minimal, whereas if you go into a very challenging case, be careful, there's, uh, what do you, what's the ultimate goal there of using this classification? Yeah, just one comment regarding your, the previous slide. Uh, you talk about complexity, but I think it's not only the complexity of the LA anatomy, but the complexity of the procedure. So in that view, I think the alignment between the, the fossa uh, and the LAA is very crucial. And uh, for me, the most challenging uh, procedures is, is when the alignment between both is uh, more horizontal and vertical. Very difficult to, to give uh, very precise uh, uh, numbers for that, but uh, I think this, is, this should be definitely taken into consideration. Yes, so um, thank you. Uh, one of the, one of the goals, yes, of the procedure is to anticipate the risk for complications uh, that are shown here, but this is more or less um, indicative because it's, of course, all of this, uh, parameters are not associated with with complications and then um, I think it, we, is it a purpose of research you said Ole um, maybe but I think definitely we need to validate these parameters with with our database uh, maybe we will see that some of them should be out and maybe we miss one or two of them uh, it's very important to think about and then to validate maybe we need much less uh, we don't know. Uh, the, the, the simplest, the, the, the best, I would say. The easier to use and the best. I think our, our common aim really is to provide a categorization that can be easily applied and that predicts, first of all, the complexity of the procedure, whether it takes 15 minutes or two hours, and second, the risk for complication as a PVL or DRT, these are the two main goals. And it really, therefore, it has to be simple so that it is used in uh, clinical practice and we foresee the use, for example, for centers that start with intervention so that they can stratify the complexity and may uh, do it on their own or call a, a proctor for a, a challenging case, etc. That's really, and ultimately it will translate into less complications because your aware is, is, is there for the complexity of the procedure. That's our, all, our, our all overall aim with, with the classification. And also to answer to uh, our colleague from Israel that um, actually you say that it, it's for an uh, advanced operator, but I think also that if you, if you start your program and you have your two, three first cases that are super complex based on this, for example, I have proctored cases when the first case was a reverse chicken wing and it was just discovering that during the case. So if up front you can anticipate that this will be the, the most complex case that you will face as the first one, that maybe you will maybe delay this patient to, uh, to, uh, to another session and start with easier case. So it can also give some uh, insight to, for new implanters. I think we really want this to be a, a clinical, uh, useful classification uh, as the primary goal. And for me, it should really uh, reflect how we think when we try to pre-plan a LA procedure. When we go through a CT data set, we will look at the orifice. Is it large? Is it oval? Is it small? What is, uh, is it low? What is the landing zone? What, uh, 
I mean, all those things, I think we actually, many of us have integrated that into our thinking about uh, an LAA procedure, and it's, it will also function as a kind of checklist before you go into a patient that you have considered all those factors. So, and I mean, when we see all those publications about LAAC and we see the, this anatomical uh, classification about chicken wing, they are not even uh, divided into reverse chicken wing or if there's long or short neck. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense at all to talk about the, the, this classification. So we want to reflect what is the challenge for the implanter. First of all, that's really our goal, and, and if we at the same time can predict if we will end up with a large leak, is this an anatomy where there is a high risk of a leak or a high risk of pericardial effusion, tamponade, etc. That should be the goal, and again, uh, I like simplification. So we, we can sort out some of the more rare uh, risk factors and then just and then we'll need your input to what do you believe, how many parameters should we include in such a classification? I, th I think it's really good what you are doing. It's for um, this grading of complexity is very helpful, especially for unexperienced centers. And I think it's really great that you made some kind of weighing the different parameters in predicting possible complications and maybe you should stratify them to uh, if they are somehow modifying the strategy. So if a proximal lobe, of course you should go for a lobe disc device, but it could be an easy uh, procedure, but it has an impact on the strategy and uh, in, in parameters predicting serious acute complications like pericardial effusion and long-term complications like DRT or, or, or relevant leakages that will no, not, not have an impact on the acute implant, but should have an impact on the uh, patient follow-ups. So this could, would be my only advice to somehow stratify it a little bit more, but I think it's really very good what you have done there. I mean, we are, we are using something similar for tear procedures, and it's very well accepted because it gives you an indication, well, this is a case I could start with, and if I'm a center and I'm starting with the first cases, I don't want to start with the most complex uh, things. Mm. And another point which is important, it, it amplifies that it makes a lot of sense to look at the morphology of the left atrial appendage before the procedure, and this is something which should be uh, really in the focus, I think, that we have a plan before we go into the procedure that we have a strategy. Okay. Please. Thank you. I think it's super interesting, all of this. I, I really don't get the third point of the classification, that is the distal part, because if the distal part doesn't affect to the landing zone, I don't think if it's so worth it to include it. So maybe some points of the second part of the classification can be moved to the third point. So maybe as, as they were uh, saying, the surrounding structures, the, <coughs> the atrial septum, or in, uh, even the proximity of the pulmonary vein, and also the mitral valve, because at the end is this kind of myxomatous mitral valve that get into the ostium. I think maybe all these anatomical features can be put in the third point, because at the end, the distal part, if it, this is not affecting the landing zone, I think it's not so important to know about that. Oh. No, I get, uh, I, I agree about that point, and the reason why we have this distal LAA is actually just to include the reverse chicken wing, because there we have a situation where we land a device in the distal part of the LAA and not exactly what is traditionally considered the landing zone, so. At the end, at the end it's because you think that your landing zone is there, so this includes in the landing zone, I yeah. think. Yeah, you could argue that, yeah. yeah. So I actually think that I, I completely agree. I don't know if I'm working with Laura, but I completely, <laughs> that's probably the reason, but I completely agree with, with her yeah. that probably to me the most important factors are ostium, landing zone, and probably the last one, the functional, thrombus yeah. and, and, and contracted. But the, the general appearance, it's nice to have it, but at the end, um, it doesn't affect. No. So it's, it's true th that it's, it's nice that it you know, feels the lag, but at the end, it's, it's ostium, because for example, if you have like a very complex ostium and an easy um, landing zone, so maybe 
you need to miss the ostium, so maybe go for a single lobe. And the opposite, if you have like a very simple ostium in a super complex landing zone, so maybe just try just to cover the ostium and then go for a, a lobe and disc. Yeah. That kind, that kind of, of thing, I, it's just the work would be just define where it's a difficult ostium, where it's a difficult uh, landing zone, and, and then this functional part, but, but maybe that would be easier, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, yeah, um, I, I like this uh, grading because it's it's very simple. But um, if you have a data database, you could also uh, try to do a scoring and and like a chats bus score, and then mm. you can see from the score uh, if it's an uh, uh, difficult uh, procedure or if there's a risk for complications. We have a com we we uh, discussed this point and uh, we concluded, yeah, yeah. for example, that nobody is using the syntax score at all because once you start with you know complex approaches, counting uh, numbers together, and here there would be quite some numbers, uh, the, the people don't use it. That's why we decided not to go for a score or proposed not to go for a score, but rather uh, provide the individual criteria in in the categories because we fear that the score will not be used. As many scores that we actually have available, maybe the Chatsvask is the only one that, or the Hasplit is the only one that is regularly used, but otherwise... Uh, but, but the score is a good idea because uh, it gives <coughs> an idea of the complexity, but the score is based on the parameters. Yes. So we have to decide the parameters. And it needs then. another step. It needs yeah. a, it's a two-step approach and people don't like... So the first step is to define what are the parameters that influence the complexity uh, of, the, of the procedure or the risk of uh, a complication? So this is not easy, but I, I, uh, I, have, I think we have to, to, to make an effort to, to simplify the, yeah. the list of, uh, of, the, of the parameters. Yes, I, I, I w just wanted to come back uh, a few seconds to a point that has been already commented, but uh, my, colleague, my colleague just behind, uh, say that, and I think we all uh, had this experience, one of our major uh, issues when we implant is the question of the axis. And, and sometimes uh, the, the shape and the depth and the, the pectins and everything could be a difficulty, but maybe 50% uh, of, of your imp uh, difficult implantations come from the axis and mm -hmm. the so the axis and the access from the, the fossa. And I, I really appreciate all, all that anatomical and, and shape considerations. I, I think they are uh, perfectly fundamental, but, but I, 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 I am, I'm afraid that we need to add some complexity mm. by uh, taking uh, in account this consideration because this is what really will uh, take uh, more time for implantation or sometimes lead to the to the unsuccess uh, uh, implantation I think we all have this experience but don't you don't you think that this can even help to to anticipate that the, the appendage itself will be complex and that you even more you need to, to focus I mean Sometimes you, you puncture the septum where you can, I mean, but, but if, for example, me, if I have a reverse chicken wing close to the mitral and so on, I'm super uh, cautious about the transeptal puncture because I know that it, it will be the main determinant. But this is something, uh, yeah, of course, if you have a, a very easy uh, takeoff of the appendage, but you completely miss your transeptal puncture, you're too high. That, so maybe it adds more complexity to the to the grading, probably. Okay, you so you think it, it comes from uh, naturally from what you see in this? That's what your well, that's your point. It, it comes naturally. You, so you think, yeah. oh, okay, and then I think some some atrias are really really complex, and and it's it, it's not a question of of, of uh, appendage. It's a question of of atria, but the shape, the outer. We, 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 we learned that we have to do the puncture in the inferior posterior portion of the, of the fossa valleys, that is true for the majority of, of uh, LAM, but it's not a, for all. Probably in, in the next future we have to, to, to look for the, the main axe of the LA on the base of a, a, and the relationship with the line between the uh, site of transeptal puncture and the um, central portion of the ostium, because it's that angle that determines the, 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 the complexity of the, of the placement. 
that is not easy because it is a 3D angle, because it's, uh, it, we have to take into account to the anterior, posterior, superior, inferior. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a complex exercise. Yeah, that, that, and I'm not, I'm not sure that we will be able to, to insert this aspect that, also in my opinion, is the, probably the, the first parameters. But yeah. I have no idea how to insert this uh, information in, 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 in the classification of the LA. Yeah, that, uh, I, I totally agree, but, but finally the point of this is try to make something simple and if possible before the procedure. So, I mean, we need to anticipate that the puncture is going to be inferior and posterior and we need to work on something simple. And I quite sure that if I, will, if I show an image of an appendage, most of us will agree if it's easy or complex. So what we are trying is to translate that yeah. into something. Yeah. So, of course, I mean, we can make this really, really complex, but if it's complex, we are not going to use it. But I'm totally sure that most of us will agree in each category, simple, medium, or complex. And as I said, probably, you know, like, I like this Nina proposal, but it could be also, you know, um, split into complex um, ostrima or complex landing zone, no? I mean, because um, then we'll define, you know, what device are you going to use uh, or not. Yeah. Um, I wanted to add a quick comment on the on this uh, uh, conical funnel-like uh, uh, shape because I, I think it, it matters. And um, there is something very simple proposed by uh, the LifeTech IFU. I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with the old criteria. Old mean, means ostium to landing zone discrepancy. If the ratio is over 1.5, it means that it's a conical shape, and it's very simple. It's not perfect, but it's simple. Mm. And uh, if we have this type of anatomy, if you use an amulet, for instance, you're pretty sure that you're not going to seal all the ostium with the external disc, uh, and it's a risk factor for peri-device leak after uh, implantation on CT, at least. So, uh, of course, LifeTech proposed the use of the multilobe with a large disc, but you can also go for a, a a washman flex, for instance. But this is very simple. That can be converted into very simple numbers, and maybe this is useful for not only all of us, but also uh, beginners. Very good comment, yeah. I, I think we're looking at the complexity of the procedure, and not only complexity of the appendage. And I agree with my colleagues over there. I think the transeptal puncture, and even the excess side tortuosity, those are all things that can make a procedure very, very difficult and which makes, yeah, certainly for beginners, make things much more complicated and also can, can lead to incomplete success or no success of procedures, so that's one. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, a score, scores are not used when they're very complex. Syntax is a lot of parameters and that's why it's not used. Huh? But uh, the CTO <laughs> score, for example, only a few parameters, I think we should really come to something like this, and then it will be used also in practice. Yes, like the ballpark medium number by patient. Yes. 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 I think this one. But it must be. It must be much more practical. This is great. This is very this is complete. Is Maybe not. Uh, I think I would include uh, the axes also, but I think it will not yeah. be used in in practice. By certainly not by the beginners. You need a simple score, I think, and that's why the weight, as it said, why the weight of certain parameters must be included. Uh, uh, one short comment is suggestion. I would remove from that. Uh, I like points. Uh, however, I do not like that uh, that graph here. I would remove that part which is simple because we knew from other procedures that there are not simple procedures. So I would only. Re uh, stay here with challenging and very challenging, remove the impossible and simple. Because simple procedure, uh, and then someone is disappointed because it was a simple procedure be <laughs> because of the morphology and I failed. So I would remove simple. And impossible, uh, when you n will not try, you never know if that, pos if that uh, procedure is impossible. Yes, so I would skip that. But impossible. how would you call it then? You have to give it a name, no? Uh, very challenging, but if oh, it's... the green and the red one. And very challenging, and then you are changing it if it's impossible because you tried it and it's impossible, really. Maybe, 
maybe very challenging and high risk of device failure, but uh, simple maybe not, but not challenging. Um, but I, I think it's, I think about when I'm proctoring about the unexperienced centers, and that's the reason why I would go for non-challenging maybe, but I think simple is okay. And uh, just to help it, uh, to make it more practical, I, even if it's somehow device specific, I would add some numbers uh, for the device size or for the uh, landing zone size, which, which is usually easy. Maybe a 30 millimeter landing zone is not is always complex, to my opinion. So I would go a, a size usually between this and that is uh, most of the cases not complex. If it's rather round, maybe it's the eccentricity index is not so uh, and so on. And the landing depths, if it's below above one centimeter, it's most of the cases. So I would add some rough parameters predicting not complex situations. Can I come back to the, the question of the axis? Because we really would like to have this classification to be applied by, for example, the pre-procedural imaging. No? Yeah. And so how would you then implement the axis? Because we would, of course, anticipate that you would puncture posterior inferior in most of the cases, maybe not if, an anterior, if there is a presence of an anterior bend. But if I assess the CT, I'm unable to predict uh, that the axis will be challenging with the exception of the criteria that are here. So which criteria derived from the CT would you mention here that have to do with the axis that are not written here? Because otherwise, it's 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 not it's not it's not accessible. May I mean, we all agree. If you find yourself with a different with a challenging axis, it's challenging, but you cannot predict it. May maybe you could. You, so how would you implement? Maybe you could you could have, uh, you know, a, a direction from the fossa to the ostium, and then then just know if there is an, an angle, and, and and quantify this angle, and. Do you think it's too... You do that uh, with success? You know, regularly? I mean, it really has to be... It's quite complex. I think we... I, mean, uh, I think we all agree that there are three main points. One is uh, the point that Oleg brought, brought up, the, whether the neck is narrow or wide. So you can say yes or no. Whether the, the angulation is sharp or not, you can say yes or no, or whether there is a lot of space behind it, so it's very forgiving or not. So three criteria, in my opinion, are the most important. If all three you say yes, then it's a very challenging. If it's two, it's a challenging. If it's one, it is a, a, a rather challenging. And if it's zero, it's a simple. So uh, that would keep it simple. And that would be the explanation uh, behind it. So, in my opinion, these are the three opinions, uh, the three points that would that you can take into consideration uh, to to grade uh, a procedure simple or very challenging. Because if you have to go through all of these, um, uh, so what does it mean if the anatomy is simple? but you have a close relationship to the pulmonary artery, so what is it then? Is it just a close anatomy to pulmonary artery makes it already challenging? I, I, I would again make this very simple and uh, uh, have these three criteria, uh, ostium uh, narrow or wide, angulation sharp or not, and uh, the space that you have available. That's my personal opinion. I think, think we have to stop now, and uh, we really appreciate the enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, and I think we all in this room believe that we need a new classification, and we need to keep it simple, clinical, relevant, and uh, we have work to do. We got a lot of good inputs now, and uh, Sergio, will you spend a few minutes in uh, making you can summarize and conclude in one minute. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's a very exciting session. Okay, the, the main concept uh, uh, emerged in this discussion is that the current classification is not adequate for, to evaluate uh, the procedural risk, uh, the rate of complication, and more in general for the, for the planning. So we, we have to move 
towards a, a new classification uh, um, adapt for the implanters. And we discussed a, a long list of parameters. I, in my opinion, is that we have to simplify. Uh, I have in my mind that we discussed this morning the Medina classification. Everyone use it because it's easy. It's easy to apply and it provides information on the, on the strategy, procedural strategy. So I suggest to, to start from the NINA charts because it provides a grading of, um, of, of, of a complexity. Of course, when we try to uh, design a classification, we, uh, we have to, to, to make the effort to, to include in the fine classes a, a spectrum of, uh, of, um, of, in, of parameters of uh, options. So it's, it's not easy, but at the end we have to decide for the simplicity. Uh, my proposal is, is that uh, once we have decided which one are the parameters that, that uh, are more influencing the, the procedure, we could think to a, an easy hub to insert the dull yes, not, yes, not, and at the end we'll have a, a grading of the complexity because uh, we have to simplify our daily practice. Uh, thanks so much because it's, uh, it has been a really, really uh, amazing uh, session. Thanks so much.